Hello and warm welcome to the first day of Utopia Week Spring 2021 and the webinar Adapting the System to the Students and Not the Other Way Around. My name is Dina Sundling. I work as Head of Academic Support at the University of Gothenburg and I will moderate this webinar. We will, among other things, present and discuss high flex blended learning and explore the pros and cons in relation to inclusion and sustainable from a student perspective. How do we ensure students have equitable learning opportunities regardless of which format they choose? And what quality and organizational aspects do we need to consider? We will address different perspectives and promote increased understanding of inclusion in practice. And to all of you who will attend this webinar, you can post questions, share your own views or feedback in the Q&A. I'm sad to say that one of our member of the panel, Mr. Hassan Al-Hilou from Brussels, had to cancel his participations today due to illness. But luckily we still have a very strong panel with us and I would now let them very briefly introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Silva Frisk. Uh, okay, thank you, Sina. Um, my name is Silva Frisk. I'm um, a senior lecturer in social anthropology um, I uh, am currently the Deputy Dean uh, for Teaching and Learning at the uh, Faculty of Social Sciences. And I have also worked at the university as a project coordinator for, the pedagog pe for our pedagogical ideas program that we developed uh, a few years back. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Linda Moreau. Hi, good afternoon uh, to all of you. Uh, my name is Linda. I'm working at PUB's Department of Education and Student Policies. I'm a curriculum developer uh, trying to initiate and facilitate process of uh, curriculum innovation and transformation. And that's why I'm also part of the Utopia curriculum team. Professor Gwen van der Welden. You are muted, I think. Honestly, you think after all this time I'd know better. I do apologize. My name is Gwen van der Velde and I'm Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Education at the University of Warwick. Um, you can imagine we've been very busy working on blended learning in one way or another over the last year. My background is partly in learning technology, but specifically in student engagement. So I'm really pleased to be here today. Thank you. Miss Chantal Dardelet. Hello, my name is Chantal Dardelet from ESSEC Business School and CY campus in Sergi, France. Uh, I joined ESSEC in 2004 to work in educational engineering for equal opportunities. And for the past two years, I have also been the executive director of ESSEC's ecological and social transition initiative, we call together which also includes a very ambitious diversity and inclusion action plan. Thank very you. happy to be with you today. And Mr. Carl Kilbo Edlund. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Carl Kilbo Edlund, uh, as you said, uh, and I currently serve as the president of the University of Gothenburg Student Unions, uh, as well as the vice president of the Utopia Student Council. In my normal day-to-day -day life, outside of these uh, tasks, I am a last-year medical student at the University of Gothenburg. And I'm also very pleased to be here today. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. And now, high flex blended learning. What is that? Silva, will you please inform us? <laughs> well, I, I, I can certainly try. Um, but I would like to start uh, by sharing an experience that I had a couple of years ago when I was teaching an elective course in the master program of, in global studies here in Gothenburg. Uh, the course content was closely linked to my own research area and uh, a small group of 10 students had actively chosen to sign up for this course, so excellent conditions. Uh, you, can, you can shift the, the image, Lisa, please, to the next one. 
Um, the day before the course introduction, I received an email from two uh, students in Hong Kong saying that due to unforeseen events, they would not be able to uh, arrive in Sweden until 10 days later. As I normally spend the first course week uh, with the, w w working with group dynamics and preparing students for an element of peer support that they're expected to do throughout the course, this really messed up my planning. I had quickly to find uh, an alternative way to introduce the two Hong Kong students into uh, the coursework. The next day, when introducing the course to the other eight students, one of them approached me in the break and explained to me that she was a working student. And this meant that she was working two jobs to support herself through her master's studies. She explained to me that her work hours were sometimes in conflict with the course schedule and that she would not be able to attend some of the, some of the compulsory seminars. And she asked if there was perhaps another way for her to do those assignments. So again, I came up with some uh, alternative solutions for, for, her, for, for this student. Then halfway through the course, another student approached me and announced that uh, one of her family members was very ill and that she had to go to Greece for the remaining part of the course. Could she perhaps finish the course from there? The other six students took the course as planned uh, with, of course, occasional absences due to the winter flu, which is uh, quite normal in February. Now, some of you may recognize the situation. And I had only 10 students in my class. But imagine 100 students and 40% request individual solutions for whatever personal or professional reasons they may have. In my experience, such requests have increased tremendously over the years in tandem with, well, perhaps increased focus on the individual in contemporary society. And being flexible and meeting the different needs of uh, uh, individual students is certainly something that I would like to do as a teacher, but it is time consuming. And it is coupled with concerns for students' possibilities to reach the learning outcome. So I started to think, maybe there's a way to turn things around. Maybe I could shift the flexibility from me over to the students. Can we please have the second? Thank you. And I asked this question. How can I design a course that offers not only some students, but all students a way to participate in the course according to their desires and needs and still make sure that their learning is supported in an equal way. This is where HyFlex course design caught my attention as I came across the work of Brian Beatty. Next. Thank you. So Beatty introduced the concept of HyFlex course design in 2006. And it combines hybrid and flexible learning. Hybrid here stands for a combination of face-to-face -face and online modalities. And flexible learning gives the students the power and I would add the responsibility to choose continuously throughout the course to attend learning activities online and or on campus. It is a course design that builds on a student-centered approach. It includes blended learning and the combination of synchronic and asynchronic learning activities. Next, please. So let's talk about a more a concrete example. So the basic idea is that students are offered several modalities to choose from for the same teaching and learning activity. Let's say we have an activity, a lecture or an exercise that takes place on campus where students and the teacher meet face to face. This is what goes on in the middle of the picture. Uh, in HyFlex, students will have a choice to attend the same activity synchronously on Zoom or through other software systems. This requires that the lecture room is equipped with technology that supports hybrid teaching, for example, large screens, uh, good sound system, 
um, interactive cameras that can follow movement in the room as well as computers and software. This will allow students on campus and students online to interact with the teacher and with each other synchronously. In HiFlex, uh, in addition, students who are unable or do not wish to, for some reason, attend the lecture, either online or face-to-face, uh, -face, are given the choice to, for example, access shorter pre-recorded lectures on the learning platform, maybe in combination with exercises or assignments that they can do on their own at a time of their own convenience. This may be in combination with online interaction with the teacher through chat or feedback sessions on Zoom with the teacher or asynchronically through recorded teacher feedback uploaded on the learning platform. Another option for students would be to access reading instructions, exercises, and other resources on the learning platform, which would allow them to work completely independently with the course content in their own pace. The important thing with HiFlex is that students may choose to use one or a combination of these modalities in relation to a specific learning activity. Some students may choose to attend the face-to-face -face activity and later, go back to the same content for repetition by accessing the pre-recorded lectures or other resources available on the learning platform. Students may also choose to use the online modality one week and then attend face-to-face -face another week, depending on their situation at the time. So HiFlex course, the uh, HiFlex course can of course be designed in many ways combining these different forms in, in different ways, as long as students have the possibility to choose throughout the course between different modalities for any given activity. So next, please. This means that HyFlex course design rests on four principles. Learner choice means that stu it's students who choose their mode of participation in the course, not me as a teacher. Equivalency means that regardless of how students participate, all activities should be designed to lead to equivalent learning. Whichever way students take through the course, they should be supported towards the intended learning outcomes in an equal way, not in the same way, but in an equal way. Uh, reusability is the third principle, which means that all teaching and learning activities in the course, all materials and resources should be available to all students. Students are not categorized according to their choice of modality. They can switch modality as they please and they can use all of them if they need. And fourth, accessibility. In HiFlex, students need technological resources so that flexible participation is a real option to them. And as Didi was introducing this in 2006, maybe having computers at home was not something that all students had. Nowadays, this is the case, but it's important in a HiFlex uh, course that um, students know what they have to access uh, in terms of technology. Uh, and I would add to the technological uh, aspects of accessibility that students may also be um, needed to be introduced to high flex principles at the beginning of such a course. Uh, because with the power to choose also comes a responsibility for one's own learning. And this is something that may be unfamiliar for, for some students who rely on teachers uh, to choose for them. Now, one could say that students' personal situations are not the university's concern, but I think they are. If we really need something with uh, lifelong learning, inclusion, broadened recruitment, there are, that are so common in uh, our, our strategic documents and visionary statements, 
we have to consider that students' lives are so much more than their studies. And I'm not saying that core, uh, HyFlex course design uh, is the only solution, and it does, certainly does not fit uh, all courses, uh, certainly does not fit all teachers, but uh, it is one way of increasing the accessibility and flexibility of higher education for our students. And for that, I think it's worth trying. Thank you. Uh, it sounds so interesting and also challenging. Adapting the system to the students, but the students, who are they? Linda, what do you have to say about this? Hi, hello. Yes, hello to all of you again, and thank you to the organizing team once more for setting this up and inviting me. Because, of course, having student centeredness and inclusion at the heart of the utopia educational model, I'm uh, very happy to participate in this uh, debate. Now, I would like to uh, bring forward my ideas in two steps, uh, starting with a yes, of course, and then move to a but let's not forget part. So yes, of course, providing student-centered and future-oriented education should be aligned with both needs and aspirations of our increasingly diverse student bodies. Over the past decades, higher education has shifted from being a privilege for a few to an obligation for all, transforming our universities from elite to mass institutions. And this, of course, asks for adapted pedagogies, educational models that allow for customized support, more flexible modes of participation, building on more diversity-rich and diversity-sensitive designs and modes of delivery. And yes, indeed, providing diversity-rich and diversity-sensitive learning experiences and educational formats is about offering content in various manners through thoughtful and balanced combination of both online as well as on-site activities, combining text, sounds, images, cognitive and physical or sensory experiences, combining lectures, moments of self-study, role plays, field research, group work, site visits, text study, etc. It's about offering multiple means of representation, participation, and uh, expression and about offering choice regarding when and how learners can participate in a course, can engage with course content, with the lectures and the peers. But it's also about valuing diverse forms of knowledge and giving all involved actors an active voice, allowing them to negotiate the applied pedagogies and collaboratively shape their learning paths. I do believe that formats such as HyFlex courses can be valuable in this regard. But it will, of course, also depend on what kind of business models our universities apply, whether these formats will equitably be available for all or not, and the ways macro trends continue reshaping the higher educational landscape and will allow students with diverse backgrounds to successfully participate in it or not. Whether they will leave academia with a life expanding experience or not. Because ensuring opportunities is of course not only a question of access, but also, and perhaps more importantly, access to what. And there's my Let's not forget part, because I believe that moving towards hyper flexibilization and personalization does not come without any risk. Let's not forget that learning in essence is a social becoming, that it is in and through interaction with others that we learn, grow and transform that we are incited to let loose on what we had believed so far to revisit our little truths, put what we thought we had known or understood in another perspective and look at it from another angle, combine it with new elements and transform it in something new. And 
I believe that's what learning is or ought to be about. Shifting, widening and expanding one's horizons by building on what one knows, did forget or hasn't found out, fully grasped or understood yet. So shaping inclusive educational offerings, in my opinion, should therefore not only entail a quantitative shift, allowing increasingly more students to access course content and participate in teaching and learning activities. It should also entail a qualitative shift, promoting more engaged pedagogies that allow students with diverse socioeconomic and ethnocultural backgrounds to collaboratively shape meaningful learning experiences and formats, building on co-stewardship, co-ownership and collateral learning, treating diversity not only as a norm, a reality, but also as an asset, a strength or a gift. Offering inclusive education, in my opinion, should not only be about providing customized offer, tailor-made experiences and support, thriving personal growth and success, but it should also foster greater understanding of and empathy for contexts, arguments, situations and positions that are unfamiliar, unconventional, less apparent, less comfortable and appreciated. It should allow learners to critically assess dominant framings and narratives, deconstruct outdated, unfair or disrespectful forms of representation or argumentation and reconstruct more suitable explanations and propositions through processes of shared main, meaning making where a diversity in perspectives, needs, ideas and ideals is purposefully embedded, actively explored and valued. Quality education, I believe, ought to be an empowering process, offering a space for change and innovation, a place where knowledge is not only passed on for reproducing an existing order, but also to reinvent, reform and transform unsustainable or unholdable status quo. It should prepare people to take responsibility for a world that does not yet exist. And that's not always an easy endeavor. Learning does not always come through the most easy or comfortable path. It is challenging, cumbersome, messy, comes both with moments of success as well as failure, feelings of of contentment as well as frustration, fear, being overwhelmed or feeling lost. And shaping a supportive environment for this, I think, in the first place asks for suitably designed and well-resourced processes, conceiving all involved actors as co-learners, mediators of different kinds of expertise and agents of change. And that is exactly what the Utopia educational model is about building on connected communities of university staff, students and extra academic partners, people with very diverse disciplinary, professional and personal backgrounds, brought together to collaboratively shape multi-voiced learning experiences and thought-provoking, sometimes perhaps transformative encounters. But of course, we're only at the beginning of our journey. And I do believe that debates such as this are an important catalyst for helping us shape a fully mature educational offerings. For it provides us with an opportunity to learn from other perspectives, listen to other voices, experiences and opinions. So thank you once more to the organizing committee for all the effort you put in preparing this week and this debate. I'm looking forward to hear our student representatives and other guest speakers. And of course, very much willing to take any questions from the audience later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Well, due to the pandemic, we all received a massive experience of digital transformation of education. But how did different groups responded to the shift and changes in educational formats? 
Gwen, I believe that you know something more about this. Yes, indeed we do. At Warwick, we have moved in uh, in very particular ways around inclusion and perhaps in particular ways around the way we've, we've moved to uh, various forms of online learning. Firstly, and totally in line with the uh, with the title of this event, we've moved firmly away from, from using deficit models, whereby we define inclusion as getting it right for specific groups, by supporting those groups specifically, by putting additional efforts in for, for those groups until they fit the sort of standards that we would normally expect. We very deliberately decided that that is a deficit model whereby we define students in terms of some perceived deficit that we are not happy with at all. Uh, in line with what uh, uh, Linda quite quite eloquently uh, uh, said earlier on, we need to think harder about what the standards are, what we think the norm is and whether that is actually a norm we want to hold on to. So instead, we've looked very much at an inclusion model whereby we're looking at what needs to change at the core in the way that we provide our learning and teaching. What is being taught? Who the assumed student is? Who the assumed uh, um, uh, expertise, who the assumed expert is? What expertise, what knowledge, what skills are, are the important skills truly for student lives and for the society that they live in? So we've moved away from a deficit model and are working very much along the lines of student engagement. So when the pandemic started, we asked departments particularly to engage with their students through what we call staff student liaison committees and student representation to get students involved in taking the early decisions and the later decisions and the decisions in the middle, the small ones, the big ones, everything in terms of how they were moving their learning and teaching online, what was, was needed in terms of support, what information provision is necessary, etc. Um, the University of Warwick has a very broad uh, discipline base. The students that, that we take in are very high quality and the, um, the staff that works at, at, at the University of Warwick is exceptionally cap capable. So it is a, it is a prime uh, um, uh, environment to really experience how differences work out in different disciplines, what is possible and how far we can take things. In that context, we've looked at that student engagement for two reasons particularly. One is the, the, the argument about why you involve students is a quality argument. If you can get the interest of students and the provision of the learning and teaching to work as, to, to align as closely as they possibly can, that's where the quality lies. And the only way that's going to be done is if departments, if academic communities talk to their students, work together with them, really find out what it is they, they need, what works and doesn't work, and do that sort of analysis with the students together. Because we find time and again that students see things in a much richer, much broader way than we do at times. The second argument is, of course, the inclusion argument. If we want to make things work for all students, then we need to make sure that we have good representation from all students from different groups and different backgrounds. And at Warwick, we've done uh, a large amount of work to make sure that that's the case and have several projects running along those lines. So the, the, um, the structures were already there to adapt and to make sure that student engagement was positively happening. We then wanted to see how things were working out in the different departments. So in term one, we put a, a survey around the university that we had a very high response rate to actually, which can be difficult with, with uh, cross institutional surveys. This one did particularly well. 71% of our students were content with the, um, the forms of learning and teaching, which were in most cases uh, at that point, blended learning or high flex learning. So that's a really positive result. And I have to say, when we received the, the initial indications and we, 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 we saw that the, the figures were going to be around 70%, considering that we were in a pandemic, in an emergency environment, and we were in the first term where a lot of students have come in new, of course, in, 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 in the first year or, or at the postgraduate degrees, into a totally different kind of environment than they were expecting. 71% is really quite an achievement. We then looked at which students particularly uh, were benefiting and which students were losing out. What we found is that students with disabilities did far better than they did previously. There are advantages here that we should not lose when we change and as we change further. 
there are still challenges. Um, uh, we are, we're looking at Teams at the moment. You will be aware there is a transcript version, which can be quite hilarious in certain disciplines and quite worrisome in, in, in some others. Transcripts for some of our students is still an issue that, that we are dealing with and we are putting structures in place. But even that is going quite well and it's getting quite far. But in terms of assessment results, what we saw that student, students with disabilities in terms of attainment did considerably better. So where that been the gap between students with disabilities and students without disabilities in the past, that was closing up quite fast. So there's a real, real gain there. What we're also seeing is, and it's a much harder group to, to, uh, uh, to look at, is for transgender and gender non-conforming students. They see real advantages in the, in the online and specifically the high flex learning, where they can choose between being present and showing a physical presence in a classroom, showing a physical presence online or showing no physical presence at all. There are still some things to overcome there, but for that group particularly, this was quite liberating. Where we are still looking at what the changes are is in terms of black attainment or the black awarding gap. Uh, we have projects going on on decolonization and several of our programs are, are, are looking at that in, in, in great detail. And um, for our black student community, it's, it's not entirely clear whether things are, have gotten better or worse in that context. And in terms of the feedback, it's very varied. So we're still working through that one. Where we did see particular problems, and perhaps not surprising, is for lower social economic groups. So students specifically who um, had, uh, were dealing with some kind of what we call internet poverty. So perhaps bad internet connections, uh, having to share machinery like a laptop with several people in their family, or not being able to keep their, their, their um, ID equipment uh, up to date. That's a very particular area of, of concern. Now, the university has been very creative in, in coming up with solutions for those groups and for quite a large number of students that made real differences. We do, however, see that for mature and part-time students, there are still issues there. The international student community, and, and, and Silva pointed at, at uh, her experience in, in, um, uh, in her teaching of the international students particularly, <clears throat> has been quite mixed. Our postgraduate taught international students have been quite pleased with the way that we've gone. And several of them have made clear that actually they, they, they would like to see this kind of provision continue. Albeit in terms of blended learning, if it means that for some part of the year they would actually uh, prefer to stay at home, then they would like that to be possible. So, of course, we need to think about how we're going to take that further. And there will be very different answers in very different uh, in, in different disciplines. However, a number of international students also made clear that they, they actually chose to join a British university because they wanted to make those connections. They wanted to make connections with peers, they wanted to make connections with staff, they wanted to make connections in a different society and a different kind of community than they would otherwise be studying in. And that is something that they've greatly missed. So where we saw that initially stu international students preferred to stay at home and said, actually, this is something that works for me in the long run. Over time, that moved to, hang on, I am missing out something here. And there is some, some real opportunity of that. And we are a highly international university of that real international mix and the, the opportunities that come out of that and the very different worldviews that you can get and the very different social experiences that we are losing out. So I hope that gives a sort of broad overview of where we are. It may be that our figures are slightly skewed because we do student engagement to a very high level. Uh, the UK has long been strong in that. Warwick is particularly strong on that one. Uh, but I think it gives some interesting indications of the effects that high flex learning may have on students. And what struck me particularly is how much can be gained for particular groups that don't necessarily gain from our education otherwise. And how much we need to be careful not to take any immediate decisions, but take some longitudinal um, uh, overview and keep, keep that in mind before we take any decisions, because students' views and students' experiences do rather change over time. And we have to keep in mind the students that are enjoying high flex learning at the moment are students who haven't chosen for high flex learning. That's a quite considerable difference than any normal kind of research 
um, uh, situation you might find yourself in. This is a critical incident kind of situation that we're in. Okay, I think that's as much as I want to say now. I want to stick to the to the five minutes and, and, and allow for questions. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Thanks, Gwen. And Chantal, at the Equal Opportunity Center, what do you work with there and how do you do it? Mm. Um, to start with, the Programme for International Student Assessment Studies, the PISA studies, show that one of the main weaknesses of the French education system is the extent of social inequalities in academic success and ambition. Thus, a working class child has seven times less chance of accessing higher education than a child of senior executive, for instance. As a result, the French grandes écoles, business schools are, as mine, engineering schools, uh, political studies institutes, have an overrepresentation of students from privileged social professional backgrounds. Yet these schools train a clear majority of French economic and political uh, decision makers. So this uh, significant lack of social diversity in the French elites is really a pity. First, the, de the decisions taken uh, are not always the best ones and do not always meet the needs and expectations of the entire population. And second, part of the population today, especially young people, have a feeling of injustice, which is dangerous for social cohesion. Maybe you remember the riots in 2005 in France. Fortunately, even though it is a st statistical reality, social inequalities in education can be avoided and our institutions of uh, higher education can act for greater justice in education and access to all higher education uh, uh, institutions. For 20 years, several grandes écoles, including mine, including ESSEC, has taken up this issue and set up an ambitious plan to fight these inequalities of destiny and gradually increase the proportion of students from poor backgrounds in their training. And it started, it's starting to work since ESSEC, for instance, has uh, at that time multiplied by four its social diversity since 2008. The approach is ambition and complex and focuses simultaneously on four levels of action. First, acting as early as possible upstream of our training programs to tell middle and high school students from disadvantaged backgrounds, why not you? This involves informing, rushing, encouraging, fighting against self-censorship and developing soft skills, critical thinking, ability to present oneself and so on. Second, adapting our student recruitment methods to eliminate potential sources of social discrimination and perhaps tomorrow to introduce dimensions of compensation for social origin by valuing the life course and the skills that have been developed there. Third, support students from working class backgrounds who enter ESSEC with substantial scholarship systems but also social support, pedagogical support if necessary, and help to compensate, for instance, the lack of network uh, when, they, when they are looking for an internship or, or job. Fourth, finally, we also must work to change the way all students view diversities in general and social diversity in particular. To this end, uh, ESSEC has, for example, created the Fresque de la Diversité, maybe Diversity Fresco, which uses the same pedagogical principles as the Fresque du Climat, Climate College, which is now well established. And uh, the, the aim is to raise awareness of the cognitive bias that lead to discrimination. The objective is then to create the conditions for a better consideration of all diversity social, territorial, but also gender equalities, for example. So this is the way France deals with the issue of equal opportunity and access to higher education. And I would love to know how it is done in the other countries here. Maybe we'll have time to discuss about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chantal. Uh, Highflex, blended learning, inclusion, students, call. What are the most important issues to address according to you? 
as the only student here today. Yes, thank you so much uh, for the word. Uh, um, and so, so many important things already having been said. I just wanted to shortly before I come to your question to reiterate from, from a student perspective the challenges that we face and, and somehow also the barriers that arise from them before I move on to, to solutions and things that, I want, that we might need to keep in mind from a student perspective. So the, as from, a, from this student perspective, then the primary challenge that we face, and as so many uh, before I have, have said, is, is the social imbalance in admission, both admission and recruitment, but also in, um, in, uh, in staying within academia, and both from a socioeconomic background uh, and uh, gender and ethnical background, but also from academic and non-academic backgrounds, and that is to all levels of higher education. I mean, we, we often talk about the bachelor and the master level uh, inclusion, but also in, in the doctoral education, we must not, not also uh, forget uh, that the, the, the inclusion is important on every level of higher education. And this is also a matter of choice of university, between a, a city university or a countryside university and a discipline. Um, but also, sp speaking as we do in, in Utopia, I wanted to highlight uh, participation in, in internationalization programs and that we do see and the Swedish, um, the Swedish Council for Higher Education has recently published reports on showing that uh, students from non-academic backgrounds participate in much, much uh, lower numbers in internationalization programs and this is important as it's of, of academic importance uh, to participate in these programs and I think this is an area where digitalization might play an important role and most certainly where utopia might play an especially important role in this regard. And so the barriers facing these students I would say are, are twofold. Uh, we have on one side the economic barriers in, in the forms of in some countries, tuition fees, but also living expenditures. And uh, from, from a Swedish perspective, I want to highlight the housing market, which is very difficult for, for students in many, in many student cities. And the social barriers that, that need to be addressed, both, both before uh, higher education even starts in the secondary education, but also by the higher education institutions themselves and how we introduce students to higher education. And, and in this regard, I wanted to lift especially the, the term of the hidden curriculum, the things that sit in the walls, so to speak, of our institutions and which you as a student are in, are in some way intended to learn throughout your studies without them being explicitly within the curriculum at any point. So coming to the solutions, I, of course, a large part of the scope of this question is outside of the university. It is in the, in the hands of the politi politics, uh, as, as Chantel uh, mentioned and uh, talked about. Uh, and in, an even larger one is actually outside the scope of the individual teacher. But I think for, for in the teaching environment, we uh, talking about this, we need to highlight the, in the importance of exposing the hidden curriculum. And that, I, I'd say, is one of the great benefits that is often overlooked about the physical teaching environment, is that it does inherently expose the hidden curriculum through the social context, uh, contacts with other students, with students who have from different backgrounds, with teachers, with discussions in the corridor, or, or why not a, a fika? Uh, or a coffee break, break, talking about these matters that are that are relevant to all students, but are not exactly written in the in the curriculum. It is important to to enable uh, students that that work or have other obligations out alongside uh, their studies, but this is both a blessing and a curse because at, and at the same time we enable these students. We also normalize what can be quite a toxic student life when you have to work two jobs beside your studies to 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 finance your apartment which in itself is a, poor, a matter of the housing crisis we normalize the situation instead of maybe addressing the the core issue here uh, that is then notwithstanding the importance of giving students planning opportunities and uh, informing students about schedule well in advance and so on that are obvious things that should be done, but we also need to, to, to highlight what that makes of the, of, 
of the student situation. Uh, there is a there is also a component that is important I in think I think in the Hyflex model of giving thought to physical teaching and to see which where where we where physical teaching makes the biggest impact. Where does give, being physically present make a difference in teaching? Uh, and this connecting and this connects to the flipped classroom model. Uh, and also the in line with that, adapting teaching to the strength of each given modality. And uh, not not least, as Silva highlighted, the importance of clarifying the technolo technological prerequisites that we put to students. For example, it is not obvious. It's not uh, it's not self given that all students have a good Wi-Fi connection or have a computer that is useful for these matters. And it's not only a question of of socioeconomics, but it's also a question of how the how student access to student places or study places within the university and on campus. I think in in the implementation of any digital pedagogy, we need to to highlight and be aware of some things, that some perils that we we have to be 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 aware of. And uh, as Linda put it very well, I think uh, learning is a very social activity. And that is one of the great privileges of being a university student. It's being introduced into the higher education social environment and uh, and the danger of flexibility and catering to an individual in that sense is that we, uh, and also as we talk about the modes of delivery, is that we, uh, under, we, we underestimate the importance of the exchange. It's not a matter of delivery. It is, should be a matter of exchange between the student and the and any model, uh, being Hyflex or being an, any other model, needs to take this into account. How do we create this exchange between the student and the teacher and the student and between among the students themselves? Uh, again, I want to highlight the importance of uncovering the hidden curriculum. And very recently, the Swedish Higher Education Authority issued a, report, a statistical report that although the overall effect of uh, on retention by the covid uh, by the by the covid pandemic there has not been a, an effect sorry it has not been an effect on retention in the swedish uh, higher education system by the covid pandemic but there has been a very clear division between high retention among students from academic backgrounds and the lower retention among students from non academic backgrounds and i think that is very alarming that we can see already in the preliminary numbers, see this big difference but where students from non-academic backgrounds seem to be disadvantaged by the transition to digital education. And I think that is that highlights exactly this issue of a hidden curriculum. Uh, so just shortly to summarize, I think we need to define very clearly when we go into these issues, what, what are the challenges that we meet and what do we want to achieve for the students? We need to use the possibility to, to focus physical attendance where it is important, but not forget that it has a very big importance. And with, since we're talking about inclusion, it has a very, especially, especially big importance for students from non-academic backgrounds because of this hidden curriculum. And going into these models, we must be aware of the hidden curriculum and how, and talk about how we teach or how teachers teach about the hidden curriculum, where students get this information, how students are introduced into higher education, how they are included in the academic social social web of academia, and, and also still keep in mind the structural barriers to inclusion in higher education. For example, the, the, the economic and the social and, and also the aspects of interna internationalization. So, I hope that was within my limits of my minutes and thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. And thank you everyone in the panel for your presentations, your interesting inputs, highlights, knowledge and information. We have a little, a few minutes left to take up a few of the questions that we received and I have one, uh, it's for you, Silva. And uh, uh, someone of our viewers want you to please explain equivalency. Okay, well, it means that um, I, I need to design the various uh, teaching and learning activities, be they uh, in a face-to-face -face modality or 
students accessing online, um, they, they, they need to all be um, helping the student, supporting the student towards the, lear the intended learning outcomes. Because the course, all students are, uh, if we're successful, all students will reach the same intended learning outcome. And so I have to, when I design a course with different modalities, I have to make sure that regardless of how the students choose to work with the content, they will all have an the equal opportunity to reach uh, the learning outcomes. And this is, this is it's, it's, it's not easy, um, uh, but if, if I have the time to, uh, plan it and organize it uh, before the course starts from, from, the, from the beginning of the course, then I at least have the chance as a teacher to think through these things. And then it, of course, depends on who the students are. And they, and the, in the Hyplex model, there is an element of students have, having to uh, develop a sense of understanding what learning fits them best. So the, the students have that responsibility, and I have the responsibility to uh, design different activities so that by doing them, all students will reach the same learning, uh, intended learning outcomes. Linda, earlier you mentioned the, the diversification of the curricula, curricula. And uh, we have a question, how do you envision this? What kind of action are you planning to undertake and why? And most importantly, how? And a short answer, please. Sorry, I had an interruption, so I didn't hear the question right. I heard Linda and then nothing yeah. more. So, sorry. <laughs> the diversification of the curricula. Uh, how do you envision this? What kind of action are you planning to undertake and why and how? Well, it is my belief that uh, diversification uh, should relate, um, perhaps as was pointed out by Carl, um, with um, revealing the hidden curriculum and uh, providing um, pedagogies that allow learners um, to actively explore uh, not only what is delivered by the teachers, but also what remains hidden deep down. I completely agree with uh, Carl when he stated that uh, learning is uh, much less about uh, delivering or transmitting knowledge than it is, um, it has something to do with negotiating uh, meaning in a collaborative way. Uh, so I would say um, that diversification of the curriculum um, means that um, you open up to diverse forms of knowledge and move away from um, 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 bringing forward dominant narratives um, and taking knowledge uh, for granted. Thank you. With a large element of flexibility, a freedom of choice also follows responsibility. But are students mature enough to handle this? What do you say, Carl? Of course, students are mature enough, definitely. I think that is one of the tasks as well of higher education, to give the frameworks to, for students to take responsibility and to, to grow into the responsibility. I mean, you're not born being able to take responsibility, but that's something you learn by given the chance to actually take responsibility. So I think depending on the framework and the support that is given to students by the introduction to higher education and what tools you are given to, to, to shoulder this responsibility, I, I'd say definitely. Good answer. And I have a question. Anyone who feels for it can answer. This flexibility, Will it not challenge quality? Can we ensure high flex courses and yet keep standard of high quality? Anyone? Yes, Gwen. I'm happy to, to come in on that one. 
not having high flex courses challenges quality at the moment by not having high flex courses and only having face to face or only having online we include some students do not include other students with high flex learning there's a real opportunity to do things differently and have students find out which route of learning works for them yes there are risks to, to quality i mean i don't want to give too glib an answer on that one but there is real opportunity here we still need to apply good quality principles to see whether things work we still need to check whether what we're really achieving is good learning outcomes and we do that at the kind of level that we would expect mm -hmm. we still need to make sure that all the quality measures that we normally put in place and i know they can be a headache at times that we still apply those and that we keep checking in with the students not just on their opinion and I agree very much with Carl. My, my line always is, whose education is it anyway? Of course, students are mature enough to have a voice in their education. If they, if they don't, they shouldn't be at university. And frankly, if we take them on, we should trust them that they know what they're doing. I mean, we're talking university level. Speaking on an ongoing basis about the quality of the learning and teaching with students is therefore wholly sensible. But it's partly in terms of opinion, but it's also partly in terms of whether learning outcomes are being reached. And they can tell you how that's going. They can be part of that sort of ongoing formative assessment to see whether things are going well. And those are basic principles of good quality management. And as long as we apply those, I have every faith in it that there are real opportunities here which will actually benefit more students. The one risk that we do run is if, as we become more inclusive, the overall results of a whole cohort might go up. And at that point, of course, the popular media or some politician or whoever it is can start saying, well, that's a clear sign that we are dumbing down and we're making things easier. And we really need to, be, to prepare ourselves for that. So we need to think hard at this point, if we continue with high flex learning, what our argument is there and what we are going to do with that. Now, I may be a little bit biased because, uh, you know, British higher education is under a lot of uh, public media scrutiny for all sorts of reasons, and I won't go into that. But we do need to think about that. If we genuinely see high flex as a way of making learning more inclusive for all students, then that's an argument we need to be prepared for. But I do think, and our figures show it, that it can actually do an awful lot of good for an awful lot of students. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah, our time is about to run out, but uh, in Utopia Week Spring 2021 has just begun, and aspects of inclusion will, of course, be addressed also during the rest of the week when we, as tomorrow, Tuesday, will uh, focus even more on education on Wednesday when cooperation is on the main agenda on Thursday, when we address research, and finally on Friday, when we sum up the week and discuss the journey ahead. I sincerely hope you enjoyed our session and that you in some way or another, as a student, a former student or a professional, will join us in our joint journey ahead. Co-working while developing educational formats, promoting inclusion at the same time as it increases both quality and flexibility. Thanks to all of you who followed us and warm and very warm thanks to you, each one of you in the panel, of course. And if we didn't have the time to answer your question, please check out the contact information that you in any second now, uh, it will be published in the Q&A. And uh, thanks again. And goodbye from me here in the studio in Gothenburg. Bye-bye.